Hello and welcome to the Oxford Reviews Poetry event. Delighted to introduce Hannah Sullivan, um, Associate Professor at New College as well as an accomplished poet. Um, Hannah's debut collection, Three Poems, was published in 2018, consequently won the T.S. Eliot Prize. Um, Sinead Morrissey, one of the judges for, um, for that year, described the collections taking on perennial themes such as our mortality, our sexuality, our gender and our movement through time and place, and doing it in such a fresh and observant way. Describing it also as an absolutely exhilarating collection. So I'm extremely delighted um, again to welcome Hannah to thank her very much for being here today. And just to start off with a few questions before we go into um, the actual poetry reading of a couple of extracts. So Hannah, um, firstly I was wondering how much poetry is of comfort to you and particularly um, during the first lockdown as well as obviously the second lockdown that we're in right now, what sort of kind of solace and comfort has poetry and writing provided for you in general? Um, yeah, uh, I wouldn't say that poetry had been providing solace um, to me during lockdown exactly, but uh, mostly because the work that I was engaged in very busily before lockdown, which was a poem about the year 2020, um, which I was reading a lot and writing a lot, had basically completely stopped because of the lack of childcare that you know, in, ensued once lockdown began. So I felt that in the first phase of lockdown in the spring, I was barely able to crawl between my you know, Microsoft Teams teaching um, endless marking for finals and uh, you know the work of cooking, shopping, all of those kinds of things. It very unfortunately rather fell out of my life for a little bit but um, it came back over the summer. Um, I, I've been reading Dante for the first time. I don't know why I never got to it before maybe because I thought that I was one day going to be able to you know read Italian well enough to read it probably in the um, original but I, I sort of picked my way through um, with the facing page text and um, yeah, that's been been bracing to read. I'm 41 now, poem about, about midlife, I think. Um, and, you know, I read a lot for, for my teacher. I mean, at the moment, um, I'm writing a lecture for next week about voice in Victorian poetry. So I've been reading some Browning this morning and I'll read some Dunbar later. It's not entirely driven by <coughs> inner, inner desires. Um, yeah. There's still a lot of reading, which is, yeah, excellent to hear. <laughs> um, and just for the next question, um, so many people watching will be um, students inspiring writers themselves, mm -hmm. um, often wanting advice for improving their writing. Um, what would your kind of best tips and pieces of advice be for anyone watching? Well, I think we're very lucky at Oxford to read so much poetry in general, because there's less prose writing in early periods of English literature, and to read so much poetry from before the present. Um, so I think that my advice to anybody who wants to be a poet would be imitation, um, you know, being willing to spend time doing writing that isn't necessarily kind of of the first order in your mind. It might turn out to be great, um, but, you know, copying styles and forms um, and, you know, if you're reading Paradise Lost, then try to write 10 lines, 12 lines, you know, in that style, because it's obviously much, it's extremely difficult to do. Um, but I think imitation, which is something certainly as an undergraduate I did a lot of, um, not with great facility, but I read classics. So I did spend a lot of time doing verse composition. And I think that it was painful for me attempt to try to you know, fit the Latin words into the meter, you know, have a list of words in your mind that you can put at the end of a pentameter. Um, it taught me to think analytically about verse composition, which is what the writers of the past, I mean, if you read words with letters, say from 1830s, 1840s, all he does is write to aspiring poets saying there's not much point in you trying to write this poem now because you're too old and you didn't learn to write verse in your youth. So I think he is actually right that if you don't learn to do this in, in your late teens, then in your early 20s maybe, um, it actually is too late. So my advice to people would be obviously to write about the topics they want to write about, but to um, think about trying to acquire kind of mastery of form. And, and also um, when writing, you know, maybe more um, seriously, not to underestimate the possibility of a kind of prose first draft. Um, that if you're finding a topic difficult to treat in in verse, it's worth writing it out in prose first. Cool, great, thank you. Um, just one final question for the reading. But um, so, as a poet and nonfiction writer, what do you think inspires you the most and is most central to your work? Um, I mean, at the moment, I think the the everyday, uh, you know, the mundane. But that's in terms of the particular project I'm working on, which is this kind of diaristic uh, poem that's all set in a few hours of one day about being at home in my house. So I've taken pleasure in describing in detail, you know, the way a toddler looks and the prodding bubbles from a bubble gun in the garden or looking really closely at the tap or, um, you know, the sound that an Amazon, Amazon box makes when you, when you rip it up. 
um, but the previous firm that I was working on, the first thing I worked on after three firms was a long kind of sequence um, about mostly about the fire in the Grenfell Tower. So obviously the source of inspiration or um, for that was very different. Um, and I spent a lot of time reading through the documentation, you know, on the inquiry website, kind of going through the PDFs of people's evidence, plans, site plans, kind of documents that were heartrending, but in themselves sort of mundane and boring. Um, I think it depends on what, what you're working on. Like I would hope, you know, that it wouldn't be constant across different projects. Um, Great, okay, thank you. Um, and now, so swiftly moving on to the reading itself, so I'll let you um, introduce the extracts um, that we've chosen and if you wanted to say anything about them or just dive straight into the reading. Um, sure, so I think you, you but I perhaps should remind me again what, what it was you wanted me to read, I think, from the fourth section. Yes, that'd be great. Yes. The final section of, of um, the second poem in the book, so why don't, why don't I start with that? So. Um, this poem is called Repeat Until Time, um, the Heraclitus poem, it's a poem about, about repetition and change, um, it's called the Heraclitus poem because Heraclitus was a Greek philosopher who thought um, endlessly about that, about the, the hidden or sort of uncanny unity of opposites. So this is the final section, um, the poem sort of works um, accretively by introducing um, examples that are meant to be very simple to start with, like the example of stepping twice or not stepping twice into the same river. Um, and then becoming more more complex. So I'm happy you asked me to read this. I think I very rarely um, read from this part of the poem. I won't have time to read all of the sections, so I'm just going to read 4.1 and 4.4, I think. Okay. Um, 4.1. Cyclical theories of the universe are out of fashion. But the Big Bang gives you vertigo. You would take solidamide, anything. Picture it as a partially inflated balloon. You think of something red in the Christmas tree, how it inflates into long bellied reindeer, then overfill, they deform, bleach. How Santa staggers wasted to his sled. But there's nowhere to be looking from. The balloon is the whole universe, so how can you be holding its neck, tromboning the rubber band? And the smell of pine needles and warm through rubber the smoothness and flatness of the universe is hard to explain with inflationary models. There is the problem of dark energy, but to think of it all happening over and over, universe after universe, each universe flat, consumed by fire, then cooling slowly like ice cubes on August afternoons, shells and pools, raw eggs whenever checked on, only for the freezer to be ravaged by fire on a hidden fifth dimension until the new universe is born. What? Would another bubble form to pop? Just so. Would it be no pulp OJ next time too? July 16th, 1945. Lightning zigzags, delays, it's minus 20 minutes, minus 19, it's the world's first countdown. And if only time could dilate, if only time could dilate or speed up, it will be never or it would be game over. I never realized seconds could be so long. Men push their cheeks together on the lino, clench back sneezes, black boots, pinched corns, and now it is now and his knuckles blanch on the post. T equals zero equals 5, 29, 49 a.m. It is very important that the thunder comes. But there is so much light, light, heat on the neck. Feynman discards the welder's glasses, eye socket ground blind, the rest See a scatter of antelope arrows and a mile wide aniseed ball, air sucked orange. But let there be mountains in the desert. A half drawn cartoon bubble waits for the joke. A red hot elephant dances on its trunk. Whose is this wig that blazes from behind? Light is a scalpel excavating retinas. A needle caught on an LP boring into bodies, and then light turns into sound into ordinary thunder, the sound catches up with the light and the desert howls. Now, nothing will ever be the same again and everything will be as it always was. He ought to say that the atomic age has begun. He feels like a boy who's aced a math test, the placid pleasure of being specially intelligent, but to come to the front of the stage like prize day, his ribs itch with eczema, sweat in loose tweeds. Historic moments are as tiresome as first nights, all lines to fluff after being cooped up, the meaning eroded by gabbling in rehearsal. 
He's remembering snow in Harvard Yard, the death of light early and grit stained slush. Afterwards, I remember the boatman called to us. The words won't come. He fumbles for them later and become Shiva, death, the shatterer of worlds. Out loud, he says, it worked. No glitches. The director takes hot thumbs from his belt loops and struts across the room, blood in bruised ears. Now we're all motherfucking sons of bitches. And repeat. Um, so from that, oh, I will turn to um, the beginning of the, the first poem. Um, so this, this poem was the, the first uh, poem that I wrote in the book um, when I, about seven or eight years ago now, so a few years before the, the volume came out. Um, I think it was, I wrote it on the verge of leaving America when I was just starting my job at Oxford. And now it seems to be retrospect that it was pretty young, but um, at the time I was very <laughs> concerned with the fact of no longer being very young, um, although very young in this poem is, is not um, entirely a positive quality. Um, are you very young in New York? Rosie used to say that New York was a fairground. You'll know when it's time, when the fair is over, but nothing seems to happen. You stand around on the same street corners, smoking, thin elbow, looking down avenues in a lime green dress with one arm raised, waiting to get older. Nothing happens. You try without success the usual prescriptions, the usual essays on innocence. I love you to the wrong person. I feel depressed. Kissing a girl, a sharpener, sea urchin, juice cleansers. But the senses laxly fed are self-replenishing, fresh as the first time. So even the eventual sameness has a savour for you. Even the sting when someone flinches at I love you is not unwelcome, like the ulcer on your tongue wetted on the ridges of a tooth. And when he slams you hard against the frame, the poor ticked sallow bruise seems truer than the speed spasm with which he came. So nothing happens. No matter what you try, the huge lost innocence at which you aimed recedes. Like long perspectives, like the sky square at the end of fifth, whitening at dawn, unseen, as you watch the unlit cabs go by. All summer the park smelled of cloves and it was dying. Now it is Labour Day and you've been sleeping through a rainstorm, half aware of the sewage and frying peanut oil and the ozone rising in the morning heat and the sound of your roommate cooking the chain. Flipping ice cubes into a brandy balloon, pouring juice over them, wouldn't be sanguinello till they giggle, popping their skins, the freezer throbs. He's been beating a man he met on Craigslist. He's been dreaming. Old New York, a James novel. The Greenwich Village Christmas, a certain kind of frost in the meatpacking district and the smell of the carcasses dull with the tang of freezing blood beside the skip of the Hudson wind. You have been thinking of the building opposite at night, the lights going off one by one, a diminished Mondrian, one acre square where a woman undresses for the city stroking her puffy thighs. You hear him talking on the phone about you, his petite connaissance. All summer you have been eating peaches from the green market. Overripe in September, they need to rest in the icebox, sitting with their bruises. All summer you have been dreaming of fall and its brittle confection of branches. Interesting. Okay, I'll read the opening section of this poem, which is called um, simply 2020. Uh, it's all set on one day, which is, is actually my, my birthday, um, which is January the 3rd, so it's just, just after New Year. The first half having been given up to space, I decided to devote my remaining life to time, this thing we live in, officially, or on like moss or the spores of a stubborn candida strain only to be gored or gaff roots fossicked out by rake or have our membranes made so permeable by azole drugs the contents of the cell flood everywhere. The bubble gun I'd bought on Amazon had come, so flushed. Times new novitiate, I stood outside the door in bellow slippers with a plastic wedge from M&S, the toes gone through and practice pulsing 
softly on the trigger, pushing dribbly, hopeless sack shapes out dead embryos that managed all the same to write themselves to spheres and bob as bubbles do the colour of a rainbow minced or diced into the ornamental tree or else just grim the fatal fence, most out of reach of the toddler capering side to side to keep his balance on the grass, one snotty finger prodding like a rapper turned jihadist threat of threat and all ten seconds in unskinned of radiance re-rendered air um.